Do me the favor of paying me a short visit. Come and enjoy the shade of my tree, and let me bring some water in order to wash your feet, and let me prepare a brief lunch for you, in order that you may refresh yourselves. Afterward, you may proceed on your journey. And they agreed to his proposal and came into his camp. And after they had stretched out under the tree, Abraham ran into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, Sarah, get some of the finest flour that we've got and make some cakes for these fellows. And then he ran off to the herd and picked out a tender, plump bullock and gave it to the servant to have it prepared. And then he brought them some yogurt and some milk and the bullock, and he set it all in front of them. After promising them a little more than a lunch, he brought them a feast and waited on them before uh, uh, himself as they sat under his tree. Now for a while the men ate in silence, and then one said, Where is Sarah, your wife? Well, she's in the tent there, he said. Well, the stranger said, I'll be back in nine months' time, and at that time... Your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now Sarah was standing just inside the flap of the tent, listening to the conversation, since she and her husband were very old, and since Sarah had passed through menopause, she was very much amused at what the stranger said. To herself, she cackled and thought, Here I am, an old woman, well worn out with a worn out husband, who's talking about going to bed with him again. But the stranger said to Abraham, Why is she laughing? Why is she saying to herself, Is it really possible for an old woman like me to have a child? And then reflects, Is anything impossible for the Lord? And then he says, I'll be back in nine months' time, and when I come back, she will have a son. Now Sarah was afraid and embarrassed, too, and she denied that she had laughed. I didn't laugh, she said. Oh, yes, you did, he said. And then the three men set out for Sodom, and Abraham went along with them to start on their way. Now, Power's uh, commentary on that little story says, There are those who think that the incarnation is a uniquely New Testament image, but from this story one can see that the Lord appears incarnate in the flesh in the Old Testament as well. He comes to Abraham here in the form of the passing stranger to whom Abraham shows hospitality. Now, in a symbolic sense, the the passing stranger is mentioned in the singular, but yet we have three that show up in the plural. Uh, But this is stranger appears in hospitality to the stranger But anyway, and while they eat together, the needy stranger reveals himself, capital H, to the patriarch as his incarnate Lord. The story adds another element to the concept of faith, for faith means not only putting the future into God's hands and leaving the meaning and significance of one's life to God, But it also means to serve God as God comes to us in the form of the stranger. So that's the big issue that uh, Power thinks this story is addressing. But he goes on and says, At the same time, this story also serves as a nice counterbalance to the earlier Abraham narratives. Here, Abraham stops thinking about himself. From a position of apparent strength, he reaches out to those who apparently have no strength. I mean, they're strangers, they're wandering through the desert, they don't have a big army or lots of supplies with them. They're just three guys walking through the desert. And so they need refreshment and rest. And he becomes the epitome of generosity and kindness. In his generosity, he receives not just Isaac, another again, the promise of Isaac, and when he's actually coming but the presence of God himself, a striking contrast to the earlier attempts at safeguarding his own interests and pursuing the child of promise in his own way, like having a child with Hagar and so forth. Anyway, that was kind of gets us back into uh, where we were uh, with those 
kinds of thoughts. But um, this whole idea of hospitality reminded me of something. Uh, when I was in uh, seminary, we had uh, one of my friends was another seminary student who just happened to be from Oklahoma. He was an interesting guy. He had uh, grown up Methodist, and then he, uh, he thought that uh, we weren't liturgical enough, and so he became an Episcopalian. And then, I can't remember why, I guess in his studies he realized that since we, uh, the Anglicans and the Roman Catholic Church were in schism, that the Roman Catholic Church was really the mother church, and if he was going to serve the church, he needed to get it right, so he became Catholic. <clears throat> and uh, he, was, he was a very interesting uh, guy. And, but one of the things he liked to do, uh, he liked to host gatherings of, of friends to celebrate special events. And he was uh, actually kind of a hedonist, uh, for he loved his fine food and his fine liqueurs and cordials, his fine tobaccos that he would smoke in his pipe. But um, most of the rest of us were very busy and we were focused on our studies and our field work assignments and what we needed to do and all those responsibilities. But he was marching to a different drumbeat. And uh, I recently was remembering him as we have been talking about um, the church here and how busy we are with our rushed schedules, not only us working at the church, but everybody else, and when and where can we get the most convenient times where people can gather. And so our Wednesday night snack suppers have become one of the ways of doing that so that <clears throat> folks don't have to go all the way home fix a meal, and then come all the way back to church, particularly if they work downtown and they live far away. We'll have the meal here, and so everybody can gather. Well, in that sense of because of the rushedness that we create a time and a place and a space where we can kind of have a little bit of time to relax and break bread together and, and share some time before we get back to all, all the business. Well, I remember his way of making us stop from all of our activities and and uh, worries about classwork and field work and we would stop and gather and come together to celebrate a birthday or or uh, <clears throat> you know somebody was getting married or um, just some holiday let's come together and let's have a feast and he would do that he would make rather than just a snack supper he would like to make a feast, and uh, <clears throat> he liked to make this dessert. It was, uh, I can't remember, anyway, uh, what was on the inside, but the outside was whipped cream, and then he got an eggshell, and he put some liquor in it, and then he lit it, and it would make, you know, overflow like a volcano. What do you call that? Flambeau. Flambeau, yeah. Uh, anyway, but he liked to do it up big, <clears throat> sort of like Abraham you know, let's have a little little respite and a little lunch. Well, and then he brings out this huge feast. Uh, kind of goes overboard, but yet it's, it's uh, important to stop and take the time. That hospitality, as I said last week, that this text uh, <clears throat> lifts up and, and was mentioned by one of our commentators that our most gracious thing we do with hospitality is give someone our time to be together and spend time together. And the food is kind of secondary, unless you go overboard and make it primary. But, <clears throat> but anyway. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, this hospitality uh, is, is the strong uh, point there. Now, did I get into the... I can't remember. I didn't make a note on my notes here of where I stopped. Did I mention the camels last week and the thing I heard on NPR... <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, that was an interesting thing that there was a, a professor from Duke that was interviewed and showed that um, <clears throat> camels were not domesticated until a time after the time that we believe Abraham as a real historical personage uh, lived and existed in the Middle East. 
and we know so little, and most of the stories in our scriptures are have a lot of legendary aspects added on and 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 expanded, but they're, the actual person is sometimes mentioned as showing his wealth and demonstrating his wealth as having camels. <clears throat> now, at the time, camels were domesticated. The average Joe couldn't afford a camel. It was the well-to-do that had the means to support a herd of camels, and usually it was because they were merchants traveling from place to place, and that became a very lucrative business because it was hard to get things transported these long distances across the desert in order to <clears throat> sell them someplace. So uh, the anachronism of it was when they were writing these stories, they had camels, they understood the symbol, symbolic nature of if someone owns camels, that is a well-to-do person. So in order to show that Abraham was well-to-do and was well-blessed by God, uh, <clears throat> that he had camels. But this this text, I mean this uh, thing on NPR that they were interviewing the uh, the professor at Duke pointed out that no, it couldn't have been... <laughs> the actual fact that he had camels, but at the time of the writing, they did, and that was a way to glorify Abraham in those writings. Anyway, the three men, the point of that, the three men did not ride up on camels showing their wealth and power and status. They just appeared on foot. And so there's no indication that Abraham should have gone out and been so gracious to them and to bow down to them the way he did because of their apparent status. They had no apparent status. And so the fact that he is so gracious is an indication of his abundant hospitality and graciousness because he did this to perfect strangers who had no sign of stature and power and, and so forth. They, they just could have been two wandering or three wandering vagabonds, but he still was hospitable to them in a, in a very powerful way. So uh, <clears throat> the note of, of the commentators who reflect on this is that in the Israelite and Hebrew and later Christian traditions, we find this spiritual reality that when that we in fact draw closer to our God, when we show hospitality, compassion, and caring for our earth companions, for other people, that when we act this way to a fellow human being, then the very action of doing that gets us closer to God. And so in the story, as it is trying to illustrate that symbolically, in that, my gosh, the stranger really is God, is God's presence. So uh, the, uh, the difference, though, that we do have a time when getting close to God we think we need to withdraw from people. Go into your closet and pray. Go aside and get into your Bible and read and study. Have your prayer time, your devotion time, which means you're not talking to your friends and, you know, gossiping about whatever or complaining about whatever. You're withdrawing away from all of that in order to center and then be open to God's Spirit. So there is a time of withdrawing, but this is saying that, that those times, particularly in our prayer time and our self-examination time and our Scripture reading time, we can get closer to God in the sense of our thinking and our feelings so that when we do go back and engage and interact with people, then we can be more God's person there and respond accordingly. And then, as I like to interpret it, um, 
as we let God's Spirit flow through us to others in the loving, kind, generous, hospitable, compassionate way that that flow of our care and concern doing God's will, then we can feel God's Spirit moving through us. And as that moves through us, then we feel close to God. That is God's closeness that we seek and desire. And it doesn't fully happen until we let it flow through us that way. I mean, we can be in prayer and all that kind of stuff, but the most powerful uh, is often when we're back out letting compassion and love come through us and touch others. So um, it's uh, like a breathing out and breathing in. You can't do just one side of it <laughs> uh, or we don't, we don't keep a living. Our United Methodist slogan and mission statement goal has often been the open hearts, open minds, open doors. Um, does that sound familiar? Y'all heard that? <clears throat> Well, that's the idea of hospitality. You know, don't be closed-minded, judgmental, and, and you know, just it's just us who are, you know, a certain way. We act a certain way, believe a certain way, think a certain way. And unless you can make yourself act and think and be our way, then don't bother coming here. You're not welcome. Only those who think and act and be like us are welcome. And... We're saying, no, that's not what we're about. We're about openness and welcoming and uh, and caring about people. And so if there's something good about what we are and what we have, then if we're open and welcoming, then we will grow together in a relationship. And, and if we're all pursuing God and following God, then that will be going together, but not because of some narrow way of our thinking and judging and making folks come to that narrow way. <clears throat> anyway, but uh, we don't have open arms in that expression. Ever think about that? Well, since I have to do Sunday school lessons, I have to write things down and think, well, what am I going to say, and should I say that, or or how come that's not there? Anyway, uh all the issues of, of sexual scandals and inappropriate touch and so forth may, may have left out, well, we don't want to be talking about open arms <clears throat> and hugging people because uh, we need to be careful. I've got a little book, and I've misplaced it, but it's called Hug Therapy. Anyone had been in a class when I taught, taught Hug Therapy several years ago? Well, there's, there's different kinds of etiquette about hugs, appropriate hugs and inappropriate hugs. Um, you know, and, and anyway, the little book is how to ask for a hug if you need a hug, how to offer a hug if you think someone is, you know, grieving. And I mean, like um, today I had a funeral for Stoner Arnold and Jerry was here this morning, his wife, and so, you know, I gave her a hug. She needed a hug, uh, and, you know, it was, you know, the body language said from her side, I need a hug, and my body language side is, I'm willing to give you a hug, you know, so, but it's a communication, and sometimes when we don't know people, sometimes we have to voice it and ask, you know, do you need a hug, or, Sometimes they'll say yes, and sometimes they say no, thanks. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't need what. But anyway, and then there's you know the bear hug, and then the A-frame hug, and then the you know different ways of touch that means we care. But I rem- in as my mind was thinking along that way, I remember a time that. I was at the hospital, and there was a crisis, and they knew I was a pastor, and they asked if I could help. There had been a death, a tragic death, and the family had gathered, and and the person had died, and they put the family in one of those little private uh, consultation rooms, and they asked if I could go in and and try to be of comfort and help for them because they were from out of town, and they didn't have a church and and so forth. So uh, I went in to see them. And the little room was crowded, 
and there's one little spot on the couch, and in this room there was couches and chairs around the edges, and a, for some reason a big kind of coffee table in the middle, and uh, a couple or three were sitting on the floor and leaning on this coffee table, and as as I had gone in, and I was listening to them tell about their loved one, and trying to kind of hear the story, and and offer whatever words of comfort I could. And this one young woman who was sitting on the floor in front of me, you know, kind of leaning on that table, started weeping. And so I kind of gently patted her on the shoulder. She swung around with such rage. If she had a knife in her hand, I would have lost my arm. And I said, whoa! Well, obviously, she had experienced a lot of wrongful touch in her life and couldn't trust who was touching her if she didn't, you know, know who it was or see who it was. And just the gentle touch got that instant violent reaction. So anyway, the point of that is, you know, we need to be careful (laughs) And I learned <laughs> real quick, you need to be real careful and don't make assumptions of who needs or wants the caring touch. Uh, because, and we, you know, we need, we need to be careful about that. Um, we may be just full of love and care and we just want to hug everybody, but not everybody wants to be hugged. And then sometimes uh, there are times People have done the best they can to get back to church after surgery. And so, oh, we're so glad to see you. Squeeze. Ah! <laughs> That's where the incision was. Don't squeeze me. <laughs> so anyway, we, we need to be careful uh, how, we, how we show the love. <coughs> anyway... Uh, the point of all of that is we need safe places where we are able to receive and care, receive care and support, love and respect, and that's the question of, of the hospitality, that spending time together. Um, now, we have all of this stuff with all of our technology and, and so forth, and there's a lot of talk with young people doing so much texting and voicemails and, and well, not voicemails, but the emails and and all of that kind of thing. And I I saw it once. Um, it was really interesting. There were two, a boy and a girl, and they were sitting at a table, and I think there's a, this was a commercial or something, um, that they were texting each other. They were having dinner together, but they couldn't talk to each other face-to-face. They were texting each other for their, their conversation. And... Um, it's it's kind of curious. Now, I know there's a particular language and codes and so forth on that that's kind of shorthand, um, and so sometimes it might be quicker <laughs> to get the message across, but the the reality is, and we're taught this at different times, and it's we need to remember it when you're an oral presenter, is that about 80% of what we communicate is communicated bodily. It's not just the words. It's the inflection of the voice. You know, if we get all excited and our voice goes high, or if we get real serious and our voice gets low, or if we talk real fast and, you know, we're all excited, da-da-da-da, you know, or if we, you know, uh, show a grimace on our face, or if our eyes are, <clears throat> Karen uh, always, uh, she calls it my big eyes. When I get upset or concerned about something, my eyes open wide. And she says, that's a scary look. <laughs> but when, you know, when we smile, you know, we're, our eyes kind of close or crinkle a little bit because our cheeks are rising and with a smile. So all of these facial expressions, our bodily expressions, if you know we're waving our hands or if we're stiff, all those things communicate so much of the meaning 
of the words we're trying to uh, convey and what the message, the words are intended to convey. And in reality, sometimes we're saying words that we're trying to convey a message that inside we don't believe it. And so the person hearing the words is reading the body language and says, I don't believe the words because the body language is sending the opposite message. And so um, it's uh, something we learn from experience. And we learn in that interpersonal physical presence that we have when we spend time with people. And, and when we spend time with people in relationship, in the relaxed time and celebrations and dinners and having lunch and coffee or, or whatever, we get to know that person and we learn their body language and, and their vocabulary and what's on their hearts and what's on their minds, you know, the things they want to talk about. Uh, and so forth. And when we learn that about folks, we can learn to understand them. We can learn to trust them, and they can understand and trust us if we put that time in the relationship. And so there's a lot of concern about so much of the texting and emails and all of that, and it may be a part of this civil discourse that's uncivil, the hostility and the misunderstandings <clears throat> in that folks don't spend time together. We've heard that the old legislators, congressmen and senators, even though they would argue and debate on the floor, they used to have dinner together. They used to see each other socially. They would stayed in Washington and they would hang out and they would talk about other stuff. Now they don't. They don't have that hospitality of welcoming each other to each other's tables or you know whatever and so everything's so quick and it's emails and we don't really understand where people are coming from and what they're feeling we just have these words so anyway the hospitality seems to be again something really missing and that's needed here okay enough with that we move on to the uh the next phase of this part of Genesis where um, we have uh, Sarah says, I did not laugh for she was afraid. And he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. And then the men set out from there and they looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, <clears throat> now here we go, we've got three men, and Abraham's going with them, and then the Lord said, meaning God, so now we're jumping back into understanding <clears throat> that one of these three, or, or all of these three, are God here with him, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Now, now it's no longer just believing that what God says, you know, go to this place, and I'll give you a child, and you'll become a great nation. But now there is this transition to an importance in doing righteousness and justice. Not only will you be someone I bless you, but now you have responsibilities. So we're getting that transition moving into this understanding of his special uh, role. He's blessed to be a blessing, and a part of the being a blessing is to teach about righteousness and justice so the whole world will understand righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave is their sin! 
I must go down to and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. <clears throat> so the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. And Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And some translations say, the Lord lingered, not Abraham lingered. And there's some debate and question about whether it was uh, which was the original and which was amended because they thought, you know, that's just not right to think that God's going to stand around twiddling God's thumbs waiting on Abraham. It is the human being's job to wait upon the Lord. But in this, as I said last week, the idea that when at the beginning of this that the Lord comes and then... Uh, Abraham says, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. <clears throat> and then that's meaning that the Lord comes, and then these three people <clears throat> show up, and then he has to be hospitable. Anyway, that's one of the Jewish midrashes. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, the Lord then came. Anyway, uh, the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, so different ways of, it's confusing if you try to get precise and draw a picture as if this is a, a script for a movie. How many characters do we need on the stage here? We need the three. Is it the three went down to Sodom, but then later it tells us it was only two. So if there's two that leave to go to Sodom, then that leaves one standing there. So were those two angels who went away and the Lord stays or what? Well, <clears throat> we're not sure exactly what's in the mind of, of the author and what they're trying to describe about the movement of people. But what is most important is the dialogue between the divine and the human being as they deal with these things. So then Abraham came near and said to the Lord, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. He's saying, God, how can you do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous fare the same as the wicked? Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? <clears throat> and the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. And Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him, suppose forty are found there. And he answered, for the sake of the forty, I will not do it. And then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak Suppose 30 are found there. And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, For the sake of the 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak, but just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. And he answered, For the sake of the 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, and then he finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. And then it goes on and says, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and we'll deal with that, that story next week if we get through this part this week. <laughs> okay, so basically what we have is the first intercessory prayer. The first intercessory prayer. Abraham is praying for Sodom. He's really not praying for Lot. You know, he's not saying, it's my nephew. I have a vested interest. I really don't care about justice. I just care about my own. It's, uh, I mean, that's important and that's, that's good. But sometimes people don't 
Did I tell you all the story about, this reminds me of the story of my first appointment when we needed a new roof on the church. Did I tell you all that? I'll tell it again. <clears throat> and so my dad was a general contractor and built a lot of big, uh, important buildings, good buildings, school buildings, all over Norman and on the campus of OU and uh, Northwest Class in High School and, and so forth. So I called him and asked him, is there a good roofer I could trust? And I, there's one of the roofing companies who said, with all the contracts I deal with, it's, you know, it's union labor and they're union contracts, but this big, they have a, a non-union sub-company that can do little jobs. And so I got their name, and then we went to the trustees' meeting, and I mentioned that, that this was a good one, and I said, no, we want this guy to do it. <clears throat> so I called my dad back, and I asked, uh, what do we know about that? And he called around, gets back to me, and he says, that guy's reputation is that he's a crook, not someone you want to get to do your job. He'll cheat the job, or he's been known to. So I get back, and I report that to the committee. They don't care. This is so-and-so's brother-in-law, member of the church's brother-in-law, but the guy isn't a member of the church. But the question of justice and what's right and best goes out the window because of who you're related to. You know, it gets... and. Um, I ought to go teach a class to uh, <clears throat> young pastors at all the seminaries and say, in your ministry, when you first get to the church, make a family tree and know who's related to whom. <laughs> because if you don't, you can lose your life stepping on a landmine. <laughs> Because of the family relationships, because what's right, what's true, often doesn't matter. But anyway, I'd read yesterday in the paper the terrible tragedy of the deaths in Moore, as they've been evaluating that the architectural firms that did the designing because of other non-compliance problems are out of business now, but the ones that designed it... Anyway, they're saying the jobs were not, the walls were not built right. They didn't put enough reinforcing steel in the concrete block. They didn't pour concrete down into the holes in the concrete block. One of the beams that was supposed to be attached to one of those brick or cinder block walls was just laying on top of it. It was not attached, and it was those bricks and walls that fell and killed the children. So there are, it matters, it matters in who does the work and, and are they certified and trained and inspected. And Wally knows how important it is to go inspect the jobs and make sure people do what's in the specs and that the specs are right. It's for people's protection that, that it's good. <clears throat> I remember I went to the West Junior High School my dad had built that school, and I was in the first class to go through as a seventh grader, brand new school. And before I got out in the ninth grade, I think after the second year, they needed to build another building because the town was growing. Another contractor got low bid on that building, and before I got done, that thing was falling apart. My dad's job was still solid and strong 20, 30 years later. And that was one of the things that he always told me about his work. You do it right. You do it right. Because, one, your reputation, but the most important thing is people are going to be in that building. They need to be safe. They need to be safe. So, anyway. So... <clears throat> Why did I get off on that? Anybody remember why I got off on that? <clears throat> I can't remember. Oh, well. So, in this, God invites Abraham into a conversation uh, about what God is planning to do. It's, um, as I had said once before, it's kind of God is saying, here's my plan, what do you think? And so Abraham starts talking to him about what he thinks about that. 
And, um, but Power uh, points out in his uh, analysis of this that we get an idea that God's ear is finely tuned to the cries of those who are exploited and who are the victims of injustice and wickedness from what God is telling Abraham. And God is compelled by God's awareness of the victim's suffering to act on their behalf. And third, there's no question or issue raised about the virtue or the character of the innocence or the innocence of those who suffer. That question isn't raised. It's uh, We have so often in our culture this, what happens is blame the victim. You know, in rape cases, so often the victim is blamed. Well, she shouldn't have been wearing such short dress. She shouldn't have been doing this, shouldn't have been doing that. She was kind of asking for it. Uh, that kind of issue is not raised here. God's compassion and concern is for those who cry out. Their pain and their agony, not their innocence is the issue, but their need. Not their piety or their righteousness, but their need. And we hear that God comes and God intervenes not only to act on behalf of the one suffering, but God also comes to act as a judge on the ones who are victimizing. <clears throat> so God is both Savior and judge here. And then the expression of the double-edged sword, the sword that cuts both ways, is often uh, an expression in our theology and the biblical expressions, meaning that two sides to God's nature. He's the rescuer and Savior of the ones in need, but also the judge for those who are the victimizers, the oppressors, uh, the ones that are doing evil. Well, Rabbi Sachs has some very interesting uh, comments about this, but unless my, well, my watch is three minutes fast, I remember. So we got a couple more minutes. I'll get started on Rabbi Sachs. He tells us this, is, <clears throat> this story here is a turning point in spiritual history. It's the first time that a human being challenges God on the matter of justice. And he says, really, there's not anything like this in all of religious literature. Um, we might have something close to it in our Christian literature where Jesus is on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? kind of asking, challenging, and then in the garden, <clears throat> you know, let this cup pass, not my will, but thy will, where there's kind of this dialogue about what should be and what's right. But in the Jesus case, it's about Jesus himself and what's happening to Jesus. It's an interpersonal thing, but with this one, it's the intercessory. It's a question of justice for others, and not about ones I know necessarily, but just a principle of justice. Will the God of justice not do and act justly? And so that argument, that dialogue is is rare in, in all of religious liturgy. Uh, <clears throat> and, and then Sachs re- says this is picked up and followed, and we have different places in the Old Testament where this Uh, theme keeps getting pointed out. But he also points out it's not the heretics or the skeptics or the uh, atheists who are challenging God, saying, and a lot of people, in a way, do that. They see unjust suffering, and they say, well, if God lets that happen, I can't believe in God. So it's kind of that way of not believing, but it's the believer who is questioning and in dialogue with God. <clears throat> and and, the, and in this one, we get God inviting Abraham into that dialogue. And as I said, it's like God saying, this is my plan, what do you think? And so he starts sharing what he thinks. <clears throat> and then he says, but why, what could God's reason for this be? Does Abraham have some special knowledge that God doesn't have? Is there some superior moral reasoning that Abraham can impart to God that God doesn't have? And Sachs says, no, that's not it. 
God is just, God is omniscient, God knows everything, but, um, and later we hear the details that there are not even ten righteous people in Sodom. Every man and boy in town comes to Lot's house and wants to do evil. There's not an innocent person there. So that whole question of for the sake of an innocent uh, is answered. But the point is that God wants Abraham to become and to teach his descendants to be agents of justice. And what that means, according to Sachs, is for justice to be done and to seen to be done, both sides must be heard. There must be an advocate for both the prosecution and for the defendant in order for the world society to know justice has been done. <clears throat> and he says this principle goes so deep in Jewish law that in a capital offense, a death penalty case, if the judges are unanimous in finding the defendant guilty, the case must be dismissed. If the judges are unanimous, the case must be dismissed. Now, our in initial reaction is, and you're shaking your head, no, that can't be, <laughs> is to say that that's ridiculous. Obviously, everyone knows this person is guilty. If it's unanimous, everyone knows he's guilty. Well, you know, he's been tried and convicted in the press, the TV news, and the public opinion. Obviously, he's guilty. Let's not waste time and money on a trial. Let's just lynch him right now. Now, some of you all may know Fred Craddock. He was a Barton Clinton Gordy lecturer here and a great preacher. And he tells a story of in his childhood town, the whole town was sure of a black man's guilt. And so they met at his church. They met at his church as a gathering place in their righteous indignation to form the mob that went out and lynched the black man. And to his horror and shame of that event, that image is still on his mind of seeing that black man hanging from a telephone pole, dead in his town. But where the mob came from was his church, was his church, because unanimous opinion, he's guilty. So that is the context and the sense in which the Jewish principle is to stand over and against. That, that principle is if there is no argument heard in defense or to mitigate for the accused, the presumption is justice has not been done or will not be done. There needs to be the case where the, both sides are heard. And in legal cases, it's supposed to be a hearing. We talk about a hearing in order to hear both sides. Well, contemplate on that this week and why both sides need to be heard, particularly when we find innocent folks have been convicted and judged in guilty, and then a lot of times on technical issues, the one who really did the deed goes free. Pray about that. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear God, these principles of justice and what is right and what is good and what is true, you want us to understand not only 